Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Rock and Talk webinar on microcracks in concrete. So my name is Hong Wong, and I'm from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Imperial College London, where I'm currently a reader in Structures and Materials. I'd like to begin by thanking the Rylum Educational Activities Committee, in particular, Professor Karen Scrivener, for inviting me to provide this webinar today. So the focus of this webinar is on microcracks, and I will start by providing an overview of cracks in concrete and why microcracks are particularly interesting and important. I will then present some highlights from recent research that aims to isolate, quantify, and understand microcracks, uh, in particular, the nature of drying shrinkage and autogenous shrinkage induced microcracks, uh, their controlling factors, and some evidence showing their influence on mass transport properties and durability of concrete. Now, I will also touch on mitigating strategies. And finally, I will make some concluding remarks uh, and highlight some uh, future research that I think are particularly important for this area. As I'm sure you know, uh, concrete is weak in tension and therefore has tendency to crack when subjected to tensile stresses. The cracks come in various shapes and sizes and they occupy a range of length scales, but can be broadly classified as either structural or non-structural cracks. So structural cracks, as the name implies, occur due to external loading. So for example, flexural cracks uh, that form on the beam subjected to bending. Now, these cracks tend to be larger than 100 microns. They're considered as large macro cracks, and we control them by providing reinforcing steel during structural design. Now, these cracks are obviously important, but I'm not so interested in them for this particular talk. What I'm more interested in are the non-structural cracks, which are caused by volume changes that occur throughout the life of the structure. Now, this excellent diagram from the Concrete Society Technical Report 2 uh, shows the different types of non-structural cracks, how they look like and, and where they are likely to be found. So, for example, concrete can crack at early ages due to excessive bleeding and settlement over steel reinforcement or over deep sections, or due to rapid uh, early age uh, drying and plastic shrinkage, or due to temperature rise uh, from heat of hydration, uh, thermal expansion and subsequent contraction and cooling. Now, other factors that cause uh, cracking include drying shrinkage and degradation mechanisms such as reinforcement corrosion, frost, sulfate attack, alkaline aggregate reaction, and so on. In, in majority of cases, the volume changes occur within the cement uh, paste itself at the micro scale. So usually it is a cement paste that shrinks or expands due to the factors uh, listed here. And when the volume changes are restrained by rigid inclusions, such as the coarse aggregates and the fine aggregates, uh, or restrained by other parts of the structure that are changing at different rates, then this produces local tensile stress concentrations that can then lead to a very fine, uh, random, and closely spaced microcracking, such as those shown uh, in this backscattered electron micrograph taken from an actual structure that have uh, suffered a severe degradation only several years of operation. Now, one can see that the microcracks occur mainly uh, within the cement uh, pace, where in this case here, it is expanding, but restrained by the aggregate particles. So personally, I, I find microcracks uh, interesting because they are small and, and they're not uh, readily detectable by the naked eye. Uh, they are complex, uh, heterogeneous, and spatially variable. And many factors can influence their initiation and propagation. And crucially, they are very difficult to control, eliminate by structural design alone. And in practice, the uh, microcracks may affect water tightness, uh, serviceability, and function of many structures that rely on the ability of concrete to act as a barrier to flow, such as water retaining uh, structures pipelines, basements, uh, foundations, and tunnel linings, and other structures designed to keep water out. Now, furthermore, cementitious materials are used to store hazardous waste for very long periods of time, where potential leakage caused by microcracking could be disastrous. 
In addition, the microcracks could act as pathways for aggressive species. So increasing the transport properties of the concrete cover beyond what we would normally expect for a well-designed uh, concrete that could then subsequently accelerate deterioration uh, leading to premature failure. So for example, uh, reinforcement corrosion is accelerated by ingress of chlorides or carbon dioxide through the uh, concrete cover and in the presence of moisture and oxygen at the steel concrete interface, uh, leading to uh, corrosion. Now, the fundamentals of corrosion of steel in concrete has been uh, nicely presented in the previous Rock and Talk uh, webinar by Professor Uli Angs, which I would highly recommend if you have not seen it yet. And although for a long time people uh, know that microcracks exist in concrete, and suspect that they may uh, impact engineering properties. To our surprise, very little research has been carried out to study microcracks in a fundamental and systematic manner. So uh, we don't really understand uh, their impact on mass transport uh, and their impact on durability of concrete. And part of the reason is, well, as I said before, they are small and difficult to detect. They are complex and especially variable. And this complexity is compounded by lack of good characterization techniques to study the mic mic microcracks at sufficiently high resolution and uh, representative volume, uh, and, uh, and together with experimental protocols to isolate, uh, to characterize and measure the effects. So decoupling and, and quantifying the effect of microcracks is not straightforward uh, because other phases uh, contribute uh, to mass transport, uh, such as the capillary and the gel pores, uh, the interfacial transition uh, zone, uh, uh, the, uh, and the moisture state within these pores. So the overall uh, transport property is dependent on a number of interacting factors. They are very difficult to, uh, to separate out. For example, when we dry uh, concrete from a saturated state, uh, usually it's the largest pores will empty first, followed by successively smaller pores. So the degree of saturation decreases, but the volume and the connectivity of the accessible pores uh, increases. Uh, at some point, the calcium silicate hydrate collapses and densifies. Uh, the pore structure coarsens uh, and shrinkage uh, could lead to microcracking when you strain. So all of these can influence uh, transport. And uh, so a major question is, how do we decouple uh, their effects, which is important because understanding these issues uh, is key to developing more durable and sustainable concrete and accurate service life predictions. So in uh, recent years, we have been doing quite a bit of research on microcracks induced by drying shrinkage uh, and autogenous shrinkage uh, using protocols that we have developed by uh, combining experimental uh, mass transport testing to study the flow of gases, water, and dissolved ions through concrete uh, and combine that with uh, imaging uh, techniques to characterize the microcracks in two dimensions and in three dimensions uh, to measure the uh, width and the uh, length distribution, the volume fraction, density, tortuosity, and, and so on and so forth. And then we also combine this with uh, numerical modeling to simulate microcrack formation uh, and, and to simulate the flow through the crack microstructure in order to improve our understanding of the nature of the microcracks, uh, their impact on transport, and to develop mitigating strategies. Now, we have applied these protocols on uh, many paste uh, and mortars and concrete with a range of uh, binder types, uh, water binder ratio, uh, aggregate type size and volume fraction, uh, they have been cured and exposed to shrinkage for up to four years, which is the limit of a typical PhD in the UK. So now I don't have the time to go through the details of the work. Uh, these are already uh, published and you're welcome to look them up in the papers if you're interested. However, I would like to focus on some of the key findings that I think are particularly relevant to this webinar. In one series of experiments, uh, we exposed saturated samples to four uh, drying regimes to induce varying degrees of microcracking. So regime A 
is a gentle stepwise drying at gradually decreasing relative humidity at room temperature until the sample reaches uh, equilibrium. As you can see in this graph here, of water content plotted against drying period. So regime A is a gentle stepwise drying. Now regimes B, C, and D are more severe drying regimes at uh, much lower humidity and uh, higher temperature to induce a much more rapid mass loss, as you can see in this graph, and therefore a greater amount of microcracking. And we characterize the resulting microcracks and uh, transport properties at every drying step along the way. Here are some uh, example fluorescent images showing how the microcracks look like uh, on the surface exposed to drying and on the cross section uh, of the sample. And we can see that concrete undergoes significant amount of microcracking. So the cracks initiate at the surface uh, that is exposed to drying, where uh, moisture loss is highest, uh, forming a typical map pattern on the surface. The cracks then propagate uh, inwards, uh, approximately perpendicular to the drying uh, surface, and occasionally they may uh, branch out or propagate around aggregate particles, uh, uh, forming matrix and, and debonding cracks. Therefore, the appearance of microcracking on this exposed surface is very different uh, to that compared to the, uh, to the cross section. But it is worth noting that the majority of these cracks occur only within the first few millimeters of the concrete cover, and this is consistent with the depth where strong moisture gradients exist. Uh, this is also known as the curing affected zone, as shown in other studies. Therefore, drying shrinkage induces shallow microcracks concentrated near the exposed surface. Now we found uh, microcracks even in samples that were gently dried uh, in room temperature, but the uh, the size and the density and the amount of uh, microcracking increases with severity of drying as one would expect. So here is an example uh, frequency uh, diagram showing uh, the increase uh, in uh, uh, microcrack, uh, well increase in the number of microcracks and the measured crack width with increasing drying severity. And the crack width ranges from about uh, one micron to about 60 microns, with the majority of the cracks having width less than 10 microns. And here is another frequency uh, diagram of the measured uh, crack length. Uh, again, uh, it shows that the amount of microcracking and the length of the microcracking uh, increase with drying severity. Uh, the majority of the cracks have lengths less than 100 microns, uh, and therefore drying shrinkage induces microcracks that are very fine and short and concentrated near the exposed surface. Another important feature that we saw uh, was that the uh, increasing aggregate size, so increasing the size of the uh, rigid inclusions at a constant volume, increases the amount of shrinkage and therefore the degree of microcracking which is very consistent with, uh, with what, what was observed in, in other studies. In another series of experiments, we sealed uh, the samples to induce internal drying, i.e. self-desiccation and autogenous shrinkage. So similar to the external uh, drying experiments shown previously, we uh, looked at a range of mixed variables uh, and we monitored samples for nearly uh, four years by measuring the linear deformation, uh, the microcracking that, that is formed, and the transport properties over time. So uh, here is a plot of uh, shrinkage of the linear deformation uh, against time. Uh, and we see that shrinkage increases with uh, time. Uh, it also increases with a low water binder ratio systems and in systems that contain uh, supplementary cementitious materials such as silica film and uh, GGBS. Uh, uh, we also see that the shrinkage increases with the uh, with the, uh, increase in the in the maximum aggregate size. However, mixes that contain uh, shrinkage reducing admixture, so SRA, uh, display the lower shrinkage, demonstrating the effectiveness of SRAs. And on this point, uh, I would highly recommend watching the 
excellent webinar by Professor Jason Wise, where he explained the fundamentals of shrinkage reducing admixtures, how they work by reducing certain tension of the pore solution and other related issues. So um, having subjected the samples to self-desiccation, uh, we then characterized the microcracking that formed uh, in these systems. And here is an example uh, using X-ray micro CT to obtain a three-dimensional image of the sample, uh, which we then process to uh, extract the uh, aggregate particles, uh, the voids, uh, and finally the microcracks. And what we observed is that self-desiccation, autogenic shrinkage, causes microcracking to occur pretty much all over the place, spanning the entire sample and forming highly interconnected structures. And again, the severity of microcracking increases with increase in, in the magnitude of shrinkage. Therefore, concretes that are strongest, uh, the densest, with lowest water binder ratios and containing supplementary cementitious materials will experience the greatest amount of microcracking. Uh, and this is a concern because we do not want the advantages of low water binder ratio and SCMs to be diluted or negated by the presence of cracks. So for example, here we have a, a series of uh, three-dimensional views of microcracks um, from X-ray CD images of concretes containing silica fume at different water binder ratios ranging from 0.2 to 0.45. And we see that the system with lowest water binder ratio experienced the most extensive microcracking. And we can also see that the autogenous, autogenous shrinkage induced microcracks are larger in size, they're more densely distributed and interconnected compared to external drawing induced microcracks. So here we show the microcrack volume fraction plotted against autogenous shrinkage and total accessible porosity. Again, this shows that the degree of microcracking increases with shrinkage and that the denser systems at low water binder ratios and containing SCMs showed the most severe microcracking, which is a potential problem. However, the use of uh, shrinkage reducing admixtures uh, is highly effective in mitigating shrinkage and therefore decreasing the amount of microcracking. So the question then is, what is the impact of microcracks on mass transport? Now, uh, some may think that because these cracks are small, surely they can't have a huge effect. Well, the microcracks are small relative to structural cracks, but they are 100 times larger than the capillary pores and many more orders of magnitude larger than the gel pores within the hydrates. And because these cracks are highly interconnected, they should accelerate transport, but we have absolutely no idea to what extent that impact may be. And so we carried out a series of experiments to try to isolate the microcracks and study their significance on mass transport. And one of the first experiments uh, that we did was to use a simple setup shown here uh, to visualize the absorption of water through uh, the microcracks. So what we did is we exposed one side of the sample uh, to water containing a special dye. And then we used fluorescence imaging to track the ingress of water in real time. Now, despite the simplicity of the setup, we were surprised to obtain images that are actually very similar in characteristics to neutron imaging. So we have accidentally also created a cheap, a poor man's version of neutron imaging. So here is a series of uh, images uh, captured on the same sample uh, showing the water absorption uh, profile uh, over time for gently dried samples where there is very little surface microcracking. And we see that the water absorption front uh, progresses uh, in a relatively uh, uniform uh, manner. And when we combine this uh, image analysis with gravimetric uh, measurement of water absorption uh, against square root of time, so this is the conventional uh, subtivity test, we find that this produces the, the classical bilinear water absorption uh, uh, per square root of time plot, where the subtivity coefficient can be determined from the slope of the initial absorption. However, for samples that were previously dried to induce surface microcracking, we consistently see that the initial uh, water uptake is dominated by rapid absorption into surface microcracks, and this causes a highly irregular penetration front. And once these microcracks become fully saturated, 
then the subsequent water uh, uptake occurs through the non crack regions and the apparent effect of the microcracks diminishes over time. And the subsequent penetration front becomes more uniform uh, until the sample reaches full saturation. So when we combine image analysis again with the conventional subtivity test, we see now that the microcracking produces a form of anomalous absorption behavior in the square root time plot. So instead of the nice uh, straight line that we will expect from classical and saturated flow theory, we now observe a non-linear or a sigmoidal uh, behavior. And this anomalous behavior increases with severity of microcracking, and therefore the microcracks accelerate the initial absorption, and this in turn distorts the square root time plot. In another experiment to detect the effect of microcracks, we applied a small uh, confining pressure on the sample uh, during transport testing in an attempt to compress the microcracks and to measure the effect of the confinement on flow properties. So here is a photo of the transport cell uh, where we have a pressure sensor placed on the surface of the sample that changes its color depending on the applied pressure. And so we carry out the uh, transport testing at increasing uh, levels of confinement. The graphs here show the measured diffusivity and permeability plotted against confining pressure for a range uh, of different samples. So we also did some image analysis to see the effect of confinement on the microcracks to correlate to the measured transport. And we see that the confinement causes the microcracks to partially close. And this causes a significant drop in flow, especially for the case of permeation and uh, for the case of samples that were severely dried. However, the microcracks have less influence on diffusion, uh, and this is because diffusion is governed by total porosity, and the microcracks account for only a small fraction of this. It is also worth noting that the applied confining pressure is actually small relative to the strength of the concrete. So obviously, real structures are subjected to much larger stresses, and therefore one may deduce that the effect of microcracks is small in structural locations that are under compression, but could be substantial in areas under tension. I think this highlights the importance of measuring transport under realistic loading conditions. It is definitely not easy uh, and an easy experiment to do, but we certainly need to more data and effort in this area. The next set of experiments concerns size effects induced by microcracking. Now, transport tests are normally carried out on samples that are around 25 to 50 millimeter thick, which represents the concrete cover, uh, with maximum size of aggregates uh, in mortars and concretes, typically up to 20 millimeter. And therefore, the T to MSA ratio, so the thickness to the maximum size of aggregates ratio, spans a wide range from about 2.5 to 20. And most standards for uh, mass transport measurement recommends testing samples at a ratio of around three. But we know that the uh, drawing microcracks are concentrated near the exposed surface. So then the question is whether the microcracks will induce some kind of size effects and whether or not the recommended ratio is sufficient to provide representative measurements. So here are some uh, data for diffusivity uh, and subtivity plotted against the T to MSA ratio. Now we can see that there are no significant size effects for diffusion and absorption. The results are fairly similar regardless of whether a thin sample or a thicker sample is tested. However, for permeability, there is a huge size effect where the measured, uh, where the measured permeability increases significantly with decrease in T to MSA ratio, especially when this ratio is below a value of 10. And this is consistent with what we saw earlier with permeability being more sensitive to microcracks compared to other transport properties. In the next series of experiments, we looked at the effect of drying and wetting on transport properties. Now it is well known that there are, there are lots of data out there showing that drying increases mass transport substantially. And as I explained earlier, there are several contributing uh, factors uh, that are difficult to isolate. 
So one of the biggest factor is variable uh, moisture content or variable saturation degree. And because we're interested in the microcranks, so we tried to isolate this by rewetting the severely dried samples to achieve a similar moisture content to the gently dried samples. So that now any residual effect on transport is most likely due to damages to the microstructure rather than to moisture content. So in a nutshell, this is how the experiments were done. We started by uh, drawing the samples using the same uh, four regimes to induce varying degrees of microcracking as we did previously. But we then introduced a, a rewetting uh, regime in a stepwise uh, manner. And we measure the transfer property at every conditioning step until the sample achieve a similar moisture content. Now I have to say that this is a simple experiment, but very tedious and time consuming to do, especially for a relatively thick concrete sample. And I'm sure that uh, my PhD students will not want to do such experiments ever again. But the data is very interesting. And here's an example for uh, gas diffusion uh, plotted against relative humidity for paste, uh, mortars, and concrete. So A, B, C, D are the four initial drying regimes as before. Uh, the red arrow uh, represents the drying path, and then the blue arrows uh, represents the rewetting paths uh, uh, respectively. And we can see that the drying has a huge impact on transport as discussed before, uh, but on rewetting, the moisture content increases via adsorption and condensation. The pore structure becomes increasingly uh, filled and bulk, so the gas transport decreases mod modestly initially and then rapidly drops to zero. And here we see a significant moisture and transport hysteresis that occur over the entire uh, relative humidity range. However, when we replot the data against degree of saturation uh, to isolate the effect of moisture, we now see that the difference between the drying and the wetting curves decrease significantly. So the curves overlap and the apparent hysteresis almost disappears completely. But if we look at the data carefully, we can detect a small uh, residual effect here, which is about less than a factor of two um, for uh, uh, diffusion that we can attribute to the effect of res uh, residual effect of drying. However, when we replot the data against degree of saturation to isolate the effect of moisture, we see that the difference between the drying and the wetting curves decrease significantly. So the curves overlap and the apparent hysteresis almost disappears completely. But if we look at the data carefully, we can detect a small residue effect of about less than a factor of two that we can attribute to the residue effect of drying induced damages on diffusion. This is another similar set of data but for gas permeability. Here we see that the residue effect of drying induced damages ranges from a factor of two for paste and mortars to a factor of four for concrete. But this is clearly much higher than diffusion because pressure induced flow is more sensitive to microcracks as we saw earlier. And this is also consistent with our earlier observations that the microcracking increases with increase in aggregate size, and therefore the residue effect in concrete is much greater than mortars or paste. So this is the effect of dry induced microcracks, which we know are shallow cracks concentrated near the first few millimeters of the exposed surface. The question is now, what about autogenous shrinkage microcracking, which is for earlier a more extensive form of microcracking. They are larger, they are highly interconnected and they span the entire sample. So we would expect that the effect of these microcracks on transport to be much greater. And indeed that is the case. So here we show the measured uh, diffusivity uh, the subtivity and permeability of concrete plotted against autogenous shrinkage for different binder types after more than three years of sealed curing. And we can see that the use of shrinkage reducing admixtures uh, is highly effective in reducing the amount of microcracking and consequently the mass transport. The residual effect of microcracking is close to a factor of uh, four or a factor of six for the case of diffusivity and subtivity uh, respectively, but a factor of more than 50 times formation. Again, highlighting the sensitivity of pressure induced flow. 
Therefore, the microcrites that are interconnected and span the entire sample can have huge impact on transport. And more importantly, I think the data shows that the, the performance of blended concretes containing SEMs can be significantly improved by preventing these microcrites to form in the first place. So one final thing that I would like to mention is the effect of self-healing. It is well known that uh, cracks have the natural ability to self-heal over time in structures exposed to wetting. And there are many stu uh, studies that have shown this effect. And here is one example done in Imperial. So we prepared cylindrical samples like this and produced a single through crack by carefully controlled uh, loading, which we then place into a test cell and the flow through crack assembly shown in the photographs. We then apply a pressure gradient uh, and monitor the flow rate through the crack over time. We can obviously change the sample type, the crack width, the pressure gradient, and the permeating fluid to investigate these factors. So here's the example data of uh, flow rate and cumulative flow uh, plotted against time in log scale for different mixes uh, containing a single 0.2 millimeter crack. We can see that the flow rate increases very rapidly and peaks at around five minutes and then gradually declines to zero flow after several days for some samples and in some other cases, uh, several hours. So this crack healing can be attributed to a number of mechanisms, such as further hydration of the cement, uh, swelling of the hydrates, uh, carbonation induced precipitation, or blockage by loose debris and so on. And the time it takes for complete healing depends on a number of factors which I won't go into detail here. The key message is that uh, here we have very small cracks, uh, 0.2 millimeter, they can heal, uh, therefore micro cracks will heal even faster. But there is a possibility of the cracks uh, reopening when dried again or when subjected to structural loading. So whether or not self-healing is su sufficiently reliable to mitigate cracking uh, and, and the impact on long-term durability remains an open question. So here are some concluding remarks and takeaway uh, messages. I hope that I've given you a good overview and evidence that microcracks exist in concrete. Uh, external drying process surface microcracking that are concentrated within the first few millimeters from the surface, but self-desiccation produces much more extensive interconnected microcracking uh, distributed throughout the entire sample. In all cases, microcracks increase with drying severity, with shrinkage, and with increase in aggregate size. Now, these microcracks are difficult to control or eliminate uh, by structural design alone, uh, and they induce some important effects. So, for example, they increase transport, especially permeation, uh, and they induce some strange behavior, such as those related to confinement, to size effects, and anomalous absorption. They also accelerate ingress of aggressive species and impact the ability of certain structures to perform as barrier to flow. When the samples are rewetted, then they display moisture and transport hysteresis, but the residual effect of microcracks decreases once differences in moisture content have been accounted for. If the samples are resaturated, then the cracks can self-heal over time due to several possible mechanisms. And we also saw that shrinkage reducing end issues is highly effective in mitigating shrinkage by cracking and impact. Lastly, I think it's worth commenting that most research are carried out in the lab on relatively small scale samples that have greater potential to crack. And so we need to be mindful of the potential impacts. I think certainly more work is needed on field structures exposed to real loading and environmental conditions and on concretes containing supplementary cementitious materials. Now, this final point is obviously important because of current emphasis on low clinker blended concretes for sustainability. And these systems tend to shrink more as we saw earlier, uh, and yet there are approaches to mitigate this and improve their overall long-term performance. Before I end the talk, I would like to thank the Violent Educational Activities Committee again for inviting me to provide this webinar. I would also like to acknowledge the following individuals who are my uh, previous and current PhD students, long-term collaborators who have contributed to this work. And also to the following funding agencies 
that have supported the research. So many thanks for listening in. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have, and I look forward to our discussion.